Hello everybody, Noah here with Learn Meta Analysis. In this video, we're gonna talk about different types of meta analysis that are commonly used. Uh, we're gonna focus on the educational field, but these are likely applicable to many fields, and I'm gonna to touch on some of the other types of meta analysis that are more common in other fields, but not necessarily seen too much in education as of now in 2024. So, by the end of this video, my hope is that you will be able to identify what meta analysis is identify the differences between conventional and three-level meta-analysis, and identify how we can use hierarchical and correlated effects and robust variance estimation to help create more robust estimates. Seems like a lot, but let's go ahead and get started. All right, so first question is, what does meta-analysis actually do? So essentially, what I want you to think about when you think about meta-analysis is I want you to think about it as a statistical aggregation of studies. So basically, we're going to take uh, effect sizes from multiple studies around the same thing, and we're going to combine them together and see what the overall effects are. Essentially, what we're doing is we're providing an overall effect size and various other statistics. And I, I know I have this kind of various other statistics on there, which makes it seem not important, but they're actually incredibly important. And we're not really going to talk about them in this video, each, each concept, so heterogeneity, outliers, um, those sorts of things. They each have their own video, so we'll talk about those in future videos. But just know that when I say various other statistics, that doesn't mean they're not important. They're actually incredibly important. Um, but for right now, we're going to focus on this overall effect size. So one thing that I want to mention here is sometimes when people see meta-analysis and they conceptually understand what it is as this statistical aggregation of studies, they think that that means that this is just what it is so in the sense of if we're looking at for example the effects of virtual characters on learning then that effect size means well this is the overall effect because they meta-analyzed it and that's true but it's not true the reason i say it's not true is because you are constrained by your literature search your inclusion criteria and your coding so these are three major factors that are going to have to be contextually relevant to interpreting this effect size so depending upon what your literature search and inclusion criteria and data coding are you might have something that is very generalizable or you might have something that is very very narrow so it really really depends on how you have structured everything else that goes along with the uh, that helps you get to this overall effect size. Like, please don't forget about that, and please make sure we are not overextending or overgeneralizing our findings. We really need to be conscientious about what key terms were used, what databases we searched, what our inclusion criteria were, et cetera. So one of the common critiques of meta-analysis is that we're comparing apples to oranges, so to speak, or we're taking very different things and comparing them to one another. But here's the thing, this is totally within your control. So you can either, you can have a confounded study like that, or you can set up your inclusion and exclusion criteria so that you don't have this problem to nearly the extent that people talk about. So yes, this can be a valid critique, but this is totally within your control. You don't have to be comparing apples to oranges. You can compare apples to apples, so to speak. You can compare like studies only. This is really under your control with your inclusion criteria. Okay, so as we start talking about meta-analysis, one of the first things that we encounter is this term, well, these terms, fixed or random effects. So when do we use each, and what is, what is the real important takeaway point here? Well, fixed effects are essentially used, and I am, I'm really making this into a simple conceptual understanding here. I, I have a the DOI of a paper here listed on the screen that I highly recommend reading if you're actually interested in conducting meta-analyses. But on a very high level, Fixed effects tend to be used when they're all participants are from one population or studies are conducted all from one lab. And essentially we're trying to generalize within that specific group. So random effects on the other hand are more when your participants are from various populations and your goal is to broadly generalize the results. So because of this, in my experience in education, we almost always use random effects. Okay, I'm gonna say that again. In education, we almost always use random effects. I see papers published with fixed effects. In some cases, they are doing it appropriately. In other cases, they aren't. Okay, so it really depends. You need to understand your sample. You need to really understand what each of these models is actually assuming. So generally speaking, from a conceptual standpoint, and what I, when I say that, what I mean is like, what I want you to understand as the reader of a paper, not necessarily someone conducting a meta-analysis. If you're gonna conduct a meta-analysis, please read the paper that I have indicated on the screen with the DOI. Um, but if you're just understanding them and you're aiming to understand and be a more informed reader, generally speaking, 
you're probably going to see random effects analyses and just understand that the overall goal of this is to be able to more broadly generalize than if we were using a fixed effects model. So the statistics are really fun, but I'm not going to go into them right now for that. Okay, so what I've created here is essentially an abbreviated taxonomy showing the types of meta-analysis. So on the left, you can see we have a conventional meta-analysis. Somewhat related to that is three-level meta-analysis. We also have Bayesian meta-analysis, structural equation modeling meta-analysis, and network meta-analysis. There's a bunch of other types too, and there's a bunch of variants of each one of these things. But for the purposes of conversation, again, not for the purposes of actually doing the analysis, but for the purposes of conversation, and if you want to be able to you know, have a big high-level understanding of different forms of meta-analysis, this is a good high-level understanding. So again, there are more forms. And there's different variants of each one of these, but this will at least get you in the ballpark of understanding what types of meta-analysis exist. So in educational fields, what we most often see are conventional and three-level meta-analyses, so that's what we're going to focus on here. But just know in other fields, like in medicine, for example, network meta-analysis is a very important technique. I just haven't seen it used in education yet. So we're going to focus primarily on conventional and three-level meta-analysis. Okay, so as I mentioned, conventional meta-analysis, which is also a two-level analysis, is by far the most common as of now. But this is changing. I'll talk about why in a little bit. So one of the major things that you need to know about conventional meta-analysis, each participant should only be counted once. This is, I've heard it referred to as the principle of statistical independence, but it is very, very, very important. Okay, if you violate that, you violate the assumptions of the analysis. Now, three-level meta-analysis, on the other hand, can account for dependencies in the data. So what that means is you can have more than one effect size per study. So I didn't, I didn't say this directly, but I'll go ahead and say that directly now. With the conventional meta-analysis, there tends to be one effect size per study. With a three-level meta-analysis, you can end up having more than one effect size per study. Okay, so other variants, as I mentioned in the previous chart, we have structural equation modeling meta-analysis, network meta-analysis, and Bayesian meta-analysis. None of those three, to my knowledge, are very common in educational sciences right now. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the conventional model, okay? This is what people have been doing for a long time, and a lot of the meta-analyses still being published here in 2024 are still conventional meta-analyses. So let's talk about that a little bit. First and foremost is this key limitation that I mentioned before, this idea of the principle of statistical independence where each participant can only be counted once. So let me give you an example of when this becomes problematic, okay? Let's imagine that we have an experiment and we want to actually code this data. It met our inclusion criteria, we wouldn't be able to analyze it in our meta-analysis. There are two groups in this study, an experimental group and a control group. So far, so good. It's exactly what we need. Now, here's where we run into problems. Let's say there's two outcome variables of interest. We have a retention outcome and a transfer outcome. Both of them measure learning, right? Here's the problem. You can't include both in a conventional model because you're going to encounter this principle of statistical independence. You'd be counting the participants twice. So instead, you have a couple different options. The most common option that I've seen are the two that I have listed here on the screen. You can either pick one and you have some uh, paradigm or some uh, decision matrix of which one you're choosing and why so it's consistent across all the studies in your sample so maybe for example you prefer transfer outcomes over retention outcomes and then you just use that one or what you can do is create a weighted mean and pooled standard deviation of the two scores but personally I don't prefer that second approach because I feel that it potentially adds some confounding variables to moderator analyses later so I tend to go with the pick one model but what happens here is you end up leaving some data on the table Right? You, have some, you have some data here that just got ignored because of the assumptions of the analysis. But this is by far the most common type of meta-analysis that we still see in the field today. Now, more recently, we've been seeing more and more three-level meta-analyses, and these offer some great advantages compared to the conventional meta-analysis. So it gets around this dependence issue, right? because we can actually include multiple comparisons from the same study. There is a limitation, though. It still assumes comparisons within studies are independent, but there are solutions to this. So one of them is co using correlated and hierarchical effects with robust variance estimation. I know that sounds really scary, but it's really not that scary. I'm gonna walk you through some diagrams that'll help explain it here in a minute. Um, but essentially what we're doing with this is we're using correlations within each study and across each comparison to actually create more robust estimates. That's a conceptual explanation, not a, not a purely accurate statistical explanation, but it gets you in the, in the mental ballpark of understanding what I'm talking about here. And again, I'm going to show you a picture that I think will explain it a little bit better. There is a limitation to this, though. 
you're selecting the correlation. It's not always known, right? It's not always known what the correlation between measures are. So you're guessing, you're essentially guessing and you can run sensitivity analyses and see how much it varies, how much the effect sizes vary depending upon the correlation that you choose. So you should always do that. Um, I have a paper here listed on the screen, uh, the DOI is down in the bottom right. If you're going to be conducting meta-analyses, especially if you're going to do correlated and hierarchical effects, highly, 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 highly recommend reading that paper. It is a wonderful paper. It'll give you a really good overview of this. All right, so I want to give you a visual representation of three-level models in meta-analysis because I think, at least for me, this is what made it click the first time that I saw this diagram, okay? Um, so I'm borrowing this diagram from this book, doing meta-analysis with R. It's available for free online wonderful resource, okay? I'm, I'm gonna say this now, if you're interested in doing meta-analysis in R, that helped me learn meta-analysis in R by a lot. It was very helpful. They also have great explanations of the statistical foundations of meta-analysis. So um, highly recommend checking out that book. And as I mentioned, it's available for free online. So if you do a search uh, for the title, you'll be able to find uh, the online version of that book. You should be able to. So I have adapted this figure a little bit just by adding some circles and some text to help us explain. So here we can see the three level model. Level one is the participants, level two is the studies, and then we have the overall stuff here at the top. But what I wanna point out is in a traditional three level meta-analysis model, it is assuming that each one of these effect sizes is independent, right? You can see how they are separated here and I have a little circle around each one. So when we talk about the hierarchical structure, this is what three-level meta-analysis is doing, is we're being able to say, these things are related to one another. This study came, I mean, this uh, effect size came out of this study, right? So the three-level model can build in that structure. But we can also look at correlations within each study, right? So I have these little green arrows here, and we can show that these might actually be related to one another. So we can model that statistically as well. And we can actually combine these two techniques to have hierarchical and correlational structure within our meta-analysis model. And then we can use robust variance estimation on top of that even to go one step further and really help us create really robust estimates. So let me talk you through what a general workflow looks like, okay? First and foremost, we're going to run our overall analysis. This is going to tell us our overall effect size and our heterogeneity statistics. Then we want to actually look at those heterogeneity statistics and understand where the variance is coming from. We can also check for outliers and influence to see if we have any studies that are potentially problematic or influential. We can make adjustments to our data if we need to and rerun everything if we need to. Next, we tend to do moderator analysis. And last, we tend to look at publication bias. So this is the workflow that I usually personally use. Um, I find that this works really well for me. The reason I like this is because when I run my overall analysis, I generally get my heterogeneity and variance statistics either at the same time or with minimal more work on top of that. And then next, I can check for my outliers and influence. And if I need to restart at that point, if I need to adjust an effect size or remove an effect size, talk more about that in the video about outliers and influence. But if I need to make some changes, then I only have to redo the overall analysis, right? I don't then have to uh, rerun a bunch of moderate analyses or publication bias analyses. So this is the workflow that I tend to use as I go through the meta-analytic process. All right, so to wrap up here, there are various forms of meta-analysis with conventional and three-level meta-analysis being the most common in education. Uh, I don't want to make a blanket statement and say that three-level meta-analysis can be used generally in most cases where we see conventional meta-analysis, but my personal opinion as of now is that there's a lot of conventional meta-analyses that could actually be three-level meta-analyses in our field. And one of the major differentiators right now is that there, at the, at the time of uh, recording this in 2024, there isn't a well-known graphic user interface program that actually allows for you to do three-level meta-analysis, but um, hopefully by now you've seen simple meta-analysis, which is a graphic user interface I've developed to let you run those three-level models. So my hope is that we're going to be have more people doing three-level models in the future rather than conventional models when the three-level model might be more appropriate. So as I mentioned, we can use various different approaches to most appropriately model our data. So we can use uh, correlated and hierarchical effects, robust variance estimation, choosing a conventional versus three-level model, etc. And last but not least, I really, I know I mentioned this a lot in the beginning, but I really just want to get a, the point across that we generally should be using random effects meta-analyses in education as a field. Um, I've seen very, very few times, and I can actually think of zero times in my head, like off the top of my head, I can actually think of zero times where fixed effects was 
the proper analysis to be run. That doesn't mean that there's not. I'm sure there are meta-analyses out there that are fixed effects and they're fixed effects for a very good reason. Um, but off the top of my head, the vast majority of meta-analyses that I've read in, in the educational field should be random effects meta-analyses. All right, so that summarizes the different types of meta-analysis that we often see in educational sciences. And I hope even if you're not in educational sciences, this gave you a great overview. Thank you guys, and I'll see you in the next video.